Uh, let's talk about nitrogen. Seventy-eight percent of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, and only around twenty-one percent is oxygen. Did you know that? Fun fact. Um, so most of the air, when it gets in the system, is in fact nitrogen. So what's the problem with nitrogen getting inside the system? Nitrogen Say that again. Nitrogen is combustible. Nitrogen is not combustible. Otherwise, the entire atmosphere would be explosive. <laughs> Nitrous oxide. Yes, nitrogen, no. What did you say, Matthew? Well, that's right, inert. It's it. Not well, inert means non-reactive. So that also means that it doesn't react with other molecules um, to create chemical reactions. So say that again. Displaces oxygen. Displaces oxygen. Um, yeah, inside a system, though, we don't, we don't mind that. Um, what else? Why don't we want nitrogen inside of an air conditioning system? What do we call that? There's a term for that. Pressurized. Non condensable. Non condensable. So why why is it called a non condensable gas? Because it doesn't condense. Now, can it condense? Yes. Yeah. Can it? Yeah, it can. And we know it can because there's such a thing as liquid nitrogen. If it couldn't condense, there'd be no such thing as liquid nitrogen. But when we say it's non condensable, we mean it does not condense inside of the air conditioning system under normal conditions be pretty abnormal conditions to get nitrogen to condense inside of an air conditioning system. So when you have a non-condensable gas inside the system, what does that result in? Like what happens inside the system when there's a non-condensable gas? What's, what's that? Pockets of nitrogen, okay. I mean, to, to, in, to one degree that is true. Those pockets tend to occur at the top. Um, it kind of it kind of floats to the top of the condenser specifically, um, but really what it does, what the nitrogen does, is it just takes up space, and when it takes up space, it increases your head pressure, makes the system not operate properly. It doesn't really circulate through the system. It does generally just find its way to the top of kind of the high point in the condenser and just sort of sits there. It doesn't condense, just takes up space. So generally speaking, when you have non-condensables, you're going to see generally high head pressure. That's the most common thing. Um, but it is also going to affect your PT relationship, um, which is going to kind of screw some things up as well. We don't want nitrogen inside the system, but we do. That isn't really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how we do use nitrogen um, and why we use nitrogen. So first off, why do we use nitrogen to pressure test the system? Why don't we use something else? It's cheap. It's cheap. That's that's probably the number one reason. It's cheap, and why is it cheap? <laughs> because 79% of the air is nitrogen, right? So it's all over the place. It's easy to get nitrogen. Now, we call it dry nitrogen. Have you ever heard anybody say that, dry nitrogen? Ever heard that term? Dry nitrogen? Well, why do they call it dry nitrogen? It's not wet. Because it ain't wet. It's because there's no, there should be minimal water vapor in the nitrogen. Why do we want minimal water vapor in the substance that we're using to pressure test the system? We have to vacuum it down afterwards. Copper corrosion. We don't want water ins water vapor inside the system or liquid water. We don't want any kind of water inside the system. Water creates corrosion. Water react. Water is very reactive. Water is a universal solvent, pretty much. So it, it creates all kinds of problems inside the system that we don't want, especially nowadays. Anybody know what kind of oil we use in most of our systems? Actually, there's two types of oil that we use. POE, does anyone know what the other one is? Mineral. Nope, we don't use mineral anymore. Sorry, what were we talking about? Yeah, you're too busy looking at your phone. I wasn't. I was talking to Bert. Oh, okay, that's just as bad. Uh, canola oil. No, not canola oil. Uh, not Castrol GTX. Not Mobile One. Uh, no, the PVE, polyvinyl ether, uh, is used in a lot of ductless systems nowadays. And uh, very similar to PoE, but PVE, uh, PVE is actually uh, even more... Uh, at my, based on my understanding, even more hygroscopic than POE, meaning it likes moisture. Um, but the good news with PVE is it doesn't change into an acid via hydrolysis. So when you take POE oil, the oil that we use in our typical 410A systems nowadays, and you allow moisture to get into it, not only does it like the moisture and it sucks it up, but then it changes. So once it changes, you don't change it back. 
if you take PoE and you contaminate it with water and then you get the water back out, what you're left with is not PoE anymore. You have alcohols and acids that are left over that end up destroying the system over time. Which is why when an old timer will tell you, man, back in my day, I didn't used to pull a vacuum. We didn't have a micron gauge. We didn't care about any of that stuff. Well, back when it was mineral oil, it wasn't nearly as big of a deal. Because mineral oil, yeah, moisture would get in there and it wasn't good for the system. But the mineral oil, first of all, didn't grab the moisture the way PoE did. So it was easier to dry the system out. And secondly, the mineral oil didn't change via hydrolysis and become this toxic goo. Have you ever heard people talk about the importance of changing copper? That it would, you know, you got to change copper. Every time you change the system, you got to change copper because those oils, they don't mix. You know, you, hear, you used to hear that when, when we first went from R22 to R410A about how the oils didn't mix and how if you left that old line set and you put the new refrigerant in there, it was just going to cause all kinds of problems. And some people would say, well, yeah, you know, the new copper is designed for the higher pressures. So let's dispel some myths here. POE oil and mineral oil, they actually are okay together. Now, it's not great to have a lot of leftover mineral oil in the system because we don't want mineral oil in with our new R410A systems because R410A doesn't move mineral oil. That's why we had to change. The mineral oil gets stuck in pockets and coats the tubing and it creates problems. So that's why we don't want it. But does the POE oil and the mineral oil get together and create a toxic goo? The answer is no, it does not. All you have to do is take the two, dump them together, stir them up, see what happens. Nothing happens. They just, they don't really mix very well, but it's not like a, it's not a major problem. The problem is, is that we had these old systems that had moisture in them and moisture was in the lines and everything else. And then we put POE oil in it and then the toxic <laughs> goo is created. So you say, look, we got all this black oil coming out of here. It must be because there was mineral oil left in the system. Incorrect, it was because there was moisture left in the system. That makes sense? So prior generations not paying attention to evacuation have resulted in issues even today. So what do we do when we go back to a system to install or we go to install a new system? We do a, we do a flush on the lines. So we're using, we should be using uh, the, either the pipe wiper kit or the new Hillmore kit to push the pigs through to make sure that we get all that stuff out of there, right? So you're physically getting that old contaminated oil out. We're doing a nitrogen purge to displace the air. Then we're flowing nitrogen while we braze. Then we're pulling a deep vacuum, right? If we do those steps, copper's copper. As long as it's not damaged, and there ain't no difference between modern copper and old copper. In fact, if anything, I'd probably choose the old copper over modern copper. There isn't an issue with copper as long as it's not damaged. And, why, and can it get damaged? Sure, it could. It could get damaged from the inside because it had so much moisture that it was actually being eaten up from the inside. It could have, uh, generally speaking, it has corrosion from the outside or abrasion from the outside if the copper wasn't run properly. We see most commonly corrosion in our line sets in Florida when they're running it through the ground and they use reclaimed water in the irrigation. And that reclaimed water has really high levels of chlorine and other chemicals to treat it. And that eats up the copper. The other time we see it is when people have water softening equipment. So something to watch for if you're ever going to be quoting a system or you're going back to an install. If you see a water softener right by it and it's dumping on that chase and now the copper is all green and nasty looking and it wasn't quoted to replace the copper, go ahead and replace the copper because even if it's not leaking now, it's going to leak. Those are just some just some things to know about kind of the old oils and all that. But but nowadays nitrogen is more important than it ever was. We know that we pressure test with nitrogen. Sometimes the question comes up, well, what do we pressure test to? And the answer is the highest safe pressure. There are some challenges that we face. If you've ever, and I talk about this a lot, when you pressurize a system and you put your nitrogen in the low side, right? And you watch your high side going up and they're going up together, right? And then all of a sudden you hit a point and it stops going up on the other side of the system, right? So, sorry, I said putting it in the low side. I said it opposite. Put it in the high side and you watch the low side go up. And then all of a sudden it hits a point where the high side keeps going up and the low side pegs. Anybody ever seen that before? When you're adding pressure to a system? Does anybody know why that happens? What's that? The TXV. Yeah, because the TXV, if you remember, that external equalizer is the closing force for the valve. And that external equalizer, all it is, is just a pressure tap into the end of the evaporator coil, into the suction line, basically. And so as that suction line pressure keeps increasing, that valve is closing, 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 closing. Once it gets to a point, it slams shut. That's the very nature of a hard shut off TXV, if you ever hear that, a non-bleed or hard shut off TXV. And all of our modern valves that we work on in air conditioning are hard shut off TXVs. Going over that level makes it kind of tricky to do a leak detection. You, you have to equalize the pressure through your gauges and that, that makes it a little less accurate. So generally speaking, you know, bring it right up to that level and not beyond that is, is kind of a good test pressure. 
Um, other than that, just look at the test pressure for both the air handler and the condenser and use, uh, don't go over the highest test pressure um, for whatever the lowest one is. So if it's 300 PSI or whatever it is, don't go over that for your test pressure of nitrogen. But the higher the pressure, the more likely you are gonna be to find leaks. Make sense? Next thing, we already talked about this last week, always use soap bubbles. Don't just rely on a pressure drop test because we get impatient with our pressure drop tests. Just because you don't see a one PSI drop doesn't mean there isn't a leak. There could be a leak that it only dropped a tenth of a PSI in the 20 minutes that you were doing a standing pressure test, which is also why I suggest using digital, either probes or gauges, and doing the delta P uh, pressure test test on them in most uh, of your you know, like your field piece app or your testo app are gonna have that in it or the actual gauges where you can actually set it into delta P mode, pressure drop mode, and it'll show you over how much time has elapsed and if there has been a decrease in pressure. So that's always something to, always something to look for in order to be more detailed. And then do your bubble test. So that's basic nitrogen pressurization, but there's two other things and you need to know the difference. One is what we call a purge or a sweep and the other is a flow. So just because you pressure test and just because you flow nitrogen doesn't mean you've purged or swept the system. So specifically, before you start to braze in your lines, it's a good idea to pressurize the lines, flow a good amount at a fairly high velocity. So run a good amount of nitrogen through in order to displace all the air from the inside before you begin to braze in the first place. Because when you're flowing nitrogen, anybody know what, what rate you flow nitrogen at? It's not, it's actually not a pressure at all. It's three to five or two to five SCFH, which is standard cubic feet per hour. Tiny, tiny flow. What's funny? How do we measure that on site? You don't, but, but you, you, you can measure it with a, I mean, so you can measure it with the old ball floating. Yeah, the floaters or the whisper. The whisper, Brian, the whisper. Which is what I, uh, and I do, I see, I, I'd say the whisper is fine. You know, if you, if you just set the T-handle, just get it to where you can just barely hear it, barely hear it, that's, that's fine. It's, you know, again, it might be a little much. Uh, it might be a little much, but you just want to make sure that it's just barely, barely, barely flowing. But again, if you just go straight to the barely, barely flowing, you didn't get all of the air out already. You want to get the air out, then go to barely flowing, right? And then even once again, it's not a bad idea once you get done before you're actually gonna do your pressure test to go ahead and purge some more through, especially when you're working on a system that already had refrigerant in it. Okay, so if you're a service tech and you just did an evaporator coil or you just did some sort of other repair, it's a good idea to flow nitrogen through the system. Now, a lot of people will say, well, how do you flow nitrogen through a compressor? And the answer is that in most cases, you do not flow nitrogen through a compressor, but you can flow it through the components around the compressor to get as much of that air out of it as you possibly can. And then you can also, it, when in doubt, if you can't flow through it, you can pressurize it and then release it. Now, Jim talks about how that can potentially condense some moisture. That's a whole other topic that uh, we're not, we don't see completely eye to eye on, but you wanna create some turbulence in the system in order to help release that um, um, refrigerant from the uh, from the inside of the system, anything that's entrained in the oil, and also potentially some moisture that gets entrained. Just helps kind of move stuff around. Because especially in an existing system, when you're using an existing line set, for example, and you didn't do the uh, pigs, run the pigs through it, that oil in there kind of has these little pockets and it'll kind of be laying in there. And so just blasting some nitrogen through it helps kind of mix it all up, stir it all up, and get the refrigerant out of the oil. So when you have a hard time pulling a vacuum, those of you who do things like compressors and evaporator coils, you're gonna notice those vacuums don't go as fast as a new system. Anybody notice that? They'll stall on you. It just, it, it's more challenging generally than a brand new system. And that's where doing that flowing of nitrogen, we call it sweeping of nitrogen, where I said flowing, flowing's when you braze. That purging or that sweeping of nitrogen is really helpful because it helps just kind of get everything moving inside the system and helps that vacuum go quicker. Same thing when you have a system that stalls, where you're pulling a vacuum, you know your vacuum pump's pulling down properly because you tested it with a micron gauge, you know you have clean oil, you've done all that already, but it's still just stalling on you. That's when you stop, you break it with nitrogen, you, you flow some nitrogen through it, just create some turbulence, and then go back to pulling your vacuum again. And that'll speed up the process. It'll help you get through that stall. Nitrogen, inert gas, abundant in the atmosphere. We don't want to leave it in the system because it takes up space, results in high head pressure, can also result in some, in some fluctuations in our pressures. Um, so we don't want to leave it in the system. 
Um, but in terms of things to leave in the system, it's much better than our two biggest enemies, which are water and oxygen. Water and oxygen are the two really bad things we do not want to leave inside the system. So nitrogen helps us deal with that, and ultimately vacuum is what makes sure that we're, that we're uh, dry at the end. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.